I am Bill O'Reilly. Thanks for watching us tonight. Can the presidential candidate solve dangerous problems? That is the subject of this evening's Talking Points memo. With five days left in the campaign, both candidates are ramping up the rhetoric. I think it would be fair to say that both Trump and Clinton know what the problems are, but have mostly put forth general solutions. Here's a prime example. Speaking in Florida yesterday, Hillary Clinton spotlighted the danger that some young Americans face on the streets where they live. Mrs. Clinton apparently believing the gun threat is upending society. Something is wrong when young people just starting their lives are dying. Something is wrong when so many parents live in fear that their child will be hurt or killed. Going to the movies, sitting in a first grade classroom, attending a Bible study. The list goes on has nothing to do with the Second Amendment and responsible gun owners. What Hillary Clinton has to know is that so far this year in the city of Chicago, 585 people have been killed and 3,100 wounded by gunfire. Most of those poor black Americans. But the problem is not gun control. Chicago and the state of Illinois have strict gun possession measures, but obviously the thugs who are shooting people don't really care about those measures, do they? Therefore, it is a total waste of time for Hillary Clinton or any other politician to say that more gun control measures are going to solve the problem of street violence. There is a solution, but neither Clinton nor Trump have mentioned it. In the USA, anyone committing any crime, any crime with a gun, even simple illegal possession, should be subject to federal mandatory prison sentences. All gun crimes should become federal crimes. That means that if cops in Chicago find a gang member or anybody else carrying an illegal weapon, they'll be prosecuted by a U.S. attorney. And if convicted, serve at least five years in a federal penitentiary. That way, American law enforcement everywhere can not only take guns off the streets, but people who illegally carry them and or use them to commit crimes. They're off the streets as well. And the upshot, pardon the pun, is that legal gun owners would be left alone. Now, that's a simple solution, but Hillary Clinton would never support it because she and many other liberals believe there are too many Americans in prison and we should be more understanding of criminal behavior. That mindset has led to carnage in cities like Chicago, Baltimore, and St. Louis. Talking Boys does not know whether Donald Trump would support federalizing gun crimes, but he should. Mr. Trump has been endorsed by the NRA and says he will uphold the rights of Americans to defend themselves with firearms. But he and every other politician must know that criminals can easily get guns. And that situation has to be confronted. So when we vote for president next Tuesday, we the people might think about candidates who really want to solve problems as opposed to candidates who just want to blow smoke. And that's a memo. Now for the top story reaction, joining us from Washington, Horace Cooper, senior fellow at the Heartland Institute, a conservative think tank. So do you resent people like Hillary Clinton speaking so generally about crime. We all know how horrendous it is in certain neighborhoods in the USA, but I have no confidence that Hillary Clinton or her party would do anything to stop it, and they haven't in Chicago. That's a Democratic-run city. 585-plus lives have just gone practically unnoticed. And in fact, if you listen carefully to the presentation that she made yesterday in Florida, it would appear that your greatest risk is while reading the Bible, while sitting in the classroom, or going to a movie. Any time anybody is shot anywhere, it is tragic. But what is happening in too many cities, and now San Antonio, Texas just announced that they have set a 25-year record for the number of homicides and shootings that are taking place, when you start seeing this with such regularity, it is clear that she and progressives alike are ignoring, ignoring these tragic deaths to pursue a wholly different agenda, an agenda that won't 
in any way minimize this continuing carnage from taking place. Right. And I think it's particularly bad in the black community. I haven't seen, though, in the Republican Party anybody call for the program that I just laid out. And again, I'm doing this so that people understand the difference between rhetoric. All right. See, the battle lines are liberal left, more gun control, more regulations, more everything. And on the right, nothing. Nothing. Free fire zone, carry uh, permits for everybody, this and that. But both sides ignore the criminal element that are going to use guns to advance their narcotics dealing, to um, you know, settle grudges. They're going to do it. Whether you're on the right or the left, they're going to do it. This gives law enforcement a powerful tool. If you are caught with an illegal gun, that's a five right there. And if you rob a 7-Eleven with the gun, that's a five on top of whatever you get for the robbing a 7-Eleven. So I don't understand why both sides just don't say, you want to solve this problem? That's the way to do it. Well, we have an example of where this kind of scenario has actually worked. Um, in the early 90s, we were experiencing an exhibited number, or high elevated number, of carjackings where people sitting That's at right. the stoplight and the Congress of the United States responded by turning that crime, which was happening with too much frequency, into a federal crime. But there was an additional thing. Both the uh, first uh, Bush administration and the first Clinton administration issued direct directives to U.S. attorneys to prioritize these types of enforcement. Right. These things have a real effect because they raise the cost of criminality. That's right. They, the the risk reward for the criminal. No, that's a brilliant point, Mr. Cooper, and I had never even thought of it, that the carjacking epidemic that we saw was pretty much stopped in its tracks. In its tracks. And so was kidnapping. If you go way back to the Lindbergh baby, uh, when the FBI said, OK, any kidnapping, uh, we're going to deal with it. And the, the uh, punishment is going to be heinous, going to be heinous. So the kidnappings largely stopped in America as well. Um, but the gun crime, this is an epidemic. We see it now. It's been going on for years. I don't believe Hillary Clinton can solve it if she gets elected. I don't even think she'll even try. Last word. Well, we absolutely need to start talking about the real kinds of solutions. One of the things that Donald Trump's urban initiative is, is looking more comprehensively at some of the problems that plague the community. The hopelessness that is caused by the unions and all of these other problems where our systems fail communities lead them to this elevated level of criminality. The left won't let us talk about the elevated level of no, criminality. No, they want to deflect it off into, they don't want guns, anybody to have guns, and that's their agenda. Mr. Cooper, we really appreciate your point of view. Thank you. Next on the rundown, Donald Trump speaking in Florida right at this moment. Do you want to see him? Do you want us to go out there? We could do it. It's like magic. I think we'll listen to him for a few minutes. Maybe he'll change his hat. Then later, we have a bevy of new presidential polling, some of it surprising. Up ahead. All right, Donald Trump campaigning in Pensacola, Florida, the panhandle. And uh, Hillary Clinton later on in Arizona this evening. Now, we come back, we have some surprising new presidential polling, and we'll talk about it with Mike Huckabee. Then later, pro Trump students being attacked at some major universities. Martha McCallum investigating that. Up ahead. <music> Campaign 2016 segment tonight, new polling. In the general election, LA Times tracking poll now has Trump up by six. Wow. ABC News tracking poll has the race a tie. Rasmussen has it tied as well. A poll by The Economist magazine is Clinton up by three points nationwide. On the state front, CNN has Clinton up by two in Florida. Trump up by six in Nevada. Trump up by five in Arizona. Clinton up by four in Pennsylvania. Colorado Emerson has Clinton leading by three. Susquehanna has Clinton up by only two in Pennsylvania. Emerson has Trump up by nine in Georgia. Winthrop has Clinton up by five in Virginia. So you can see the race is what they call fluid. Joining us from Santa Rosa Beach, Florida, Mike Huckabee. Any kind of insight into the polling today, Governor? Anything you saw? Well, there's a couple of things I think that are irrefutable. Number one, the polls have moved dramatically over the last uh, week or 10 days, and they've all moved in the direction of giving Donald Trump the win behind his back. That, that's just the way it is. And to be in that position this close to the election is a godsend for Donald Trump. The second thing I think we see from these polls 
is that a lot of people are still not saying who they're going to vote for. And the reason is because if they say they're going to vote for Donald Trump, they're going to get called a racist, a bigot, a xenophobe. Uh, they're just not wanting to do that. And I hear this all over the country. I travel almost five, six days a week, and that's what I continually hear. It is exactly what I heard when I was in the UK in June during the Brexit vote. Same kind of thing. People didn't tell the pollsters what they really, what they really Not were thinking. Not to Trump people are counting on in states like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, where they're running behind right now. They're counting on people not really leveling with the pollsters. Um, when you see the um, Clinton campaign, she's not doing that many events. Like, like uh, Trump was running around all Florida. I think he did four events today. She, Clinton had two. Uh, one in Las Vegas and then uh, one tonight, I think, uh, outside of Phoenix. She doesn't seem to be, you know, I don't know whether she's sitting on it or she's tired. Any read into that? Well, you know, she yelled at a heckler and she said, I am sick and tired. And then she went on with other things. But I said the news flash there was that she finally admitted that she was both sick and tired. She doesn't look bad out uh, you there. Know, she looks OK. I mean, it's just not like. Yeah, she, like she looks okay, but she isn't doing a lot of events, no. and I'll tell you why she's not. They're afraid she'll make a big mistake, just like yelling at a heckler was a huge mistake. So they're just going to keep her hidden. I mean, it's easier to find, uh, you know, Huma Abedin right now than it is <laughs> Hillary for the most part. But I don't know. You know she's pretty disciplined on the strategy. stump, though. She reads the teleprompter. She yells at Trump yeah. for not liking women, and and then she goes home. And it's stand. And Trump does the standard <laughs> speech too. It, you just heard him in Pensacola. I don't think it was anything new ground there. They both have their raps, and they're going to go to Tuesday rapping what they've said before. But I don't know. It's funny because Romney. I uh, thought he was ahead uh, last time around. And we'll get into this more on Sunday now. We get a special factor. Romney thought he had it um, because he was up by five with about six days to go. And then he went underground. Romney went underground, disappeared. Nobody could find him. And then Sandy came in, the storm, and, and blew the politics off the front page. And then Romney woke up on Tuesday and got, a, got thumped uh, because... Uh, Obama was running around in a little president jacket, uh, giving Christie a hug on the beach with Sandy, and, and, and he was in the news. So I don't know if it's smart for the Clinton campaign to sit on it. She hasn't done any interviews. Have you seen her do any interviews with anybody? I haven't seen her do any interviews. No, she doesn't do any interviews. No. I haven't seen her been on uh, the, the Factor. No. Uh, you know, she's going to do an interview. She's going to do it with you, right? Well, she but told she us she would do because it. Because she doesn't want to. And then she didn't keep her word. I don't. Well, Bill, <laughs> one of the problems Hillary so. has is nobody trusts her. I mean, 11 percent of the American people say that she's honest and trustworthy. To compare that, the same poll found that 14 percent of Americans believe in Bigfoot. Now, that's what kind of trouble she's in. <laughs> I want to trust her, though. Seriously. Governor. See, I wanted her to come in. I wanted her to keep her word, but she didn't. Uh, real fast, Brett Baer is uh, reporting that the uh, FBI has a uh, supersonic investigation into the Clinton Foundation. Um, this is new information because it was like back and forth. Are they looking at it or are they not looking at it? Baer says they are looking at it hard, the feds. But this is not going to come to fruition. Neither is the email stuff that Comey uh, put out last Friday by Election Day. It's just not. So that, if Clinton wins, opens the specter that you might have a inauguration with handcuffs on the wrist. <laughs> you know, I mean, she could be <laughs> elected and then indicted. It's possible. It's possible. Look, the big difference between the Clintons and the Sopranos is that the Sopranos never left an email trail. <laughs> Sooner or later, somebody in the Clinton orbit is going to get a music scholarship and they're going to start singing to high heaven to the FBI. I and don't know. Everybody's got immunity. The they even gave me immunity. Well, I, mean, I have immunity. Not if they in lied, the Bill. Thing. Not know. if they lied. So uh, before, here's the deal. If, if they know, lied, if they, they don't lied, get immunity. It goes away. Their immunity deals are gone. Right. But remember who the attorney general is. Um, so I just want to make one thing clear on the Sopranos thing. So you're saying that Hillary Clinton's campaign is illegally lending money to people and, is that, and they have a condo in Jersey? I, I think it could be worse than that, Bill. It may be much worse. It may be the worse. The fact is, you know, how, how do you collect $153 million in speaking fees from 2001 to 13? That's pretty, that's pretty major. Yeah. You got to be a, a lot of good opening jokes, Governor, to get that kind of jack. We appreciate you uh, coming working. on, as always. Thank you. Directly ahead, new polling says the media 
in the tank for Hillary Clinton. We'll give you the numbers on that. And Miller on how to survive until Election Day. The Factor is coming right back. In fact, segment tonight, one of Donald Trump's main themes on the road is that the media is corrupt, heavily favoring Hillary Clinton. Another important issue for Americans is integrity in journalism. These people are among the most dishonest people I've ever met, spoken to, done business with. These are the most dishonest people. And a new poll from USA Today backs Trump up to some extent. The question, who do you think the media would like to see elect a president? Hillary Clinton, 75 percent. Donald Trump, 8 percent. Don't know, 11 percent. Joining us now from Indianapolis, Jeff McCall teaches communications at DePaul University. Here in New York City, Merrill Brown, director of Montclair State University School of Communication. You surprised by that poll? That's a huge 75 to 8? Well, first of all, that's what people think. And the phrase liberal media is in everybody's vernacular these days. So I'm not surprised in the slightest. We know from past surveys that media vote liberal by and large. It's not at the 100 percent level. No surprise at all. But I'm surprised at the uh, at the gap, 75 to 8, because if you ask the liberal Liberal pundits say, oh, no, no, no. You know, look, if you went to the New York Times newsroom tonight, professor, and you said, do you guys favor uh, Hillary Clinton? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. You know they'd say that. Uh, of course they would say that, as, as they have to. But private surveys that have been done in the past say that reporters generally covering national campaigns lean Democratic and lean liberal. But the problem with the whole premise is we like to believe they're doing their job. You have a political point of view. You don't tell everybody who you're going to vote for. You do your job as best you can because you're a serious-minded journalist. I'd say that about most of the media as well. Okay. Would you say that about uh, most of the media, Professor McCall? Because the American people think it, the fix is in, as Trump might say. Yeah, the, the media, you know, the, the reporters are a reflection of the environments in which they live. And they live in newsrooms where most of their colleagues lean left, and they went to colleges and J schools where most of their professors leaned left. I find these poll results fascinating. By the way, it's worth pointing out that the uh, USA Today poll you're talking about is supported by other polling that came out from Quinnipiac and from the Associated Press recently. So there's a consistency here in those poll results. And one thing that I find really fascinating about these poll results is that clearly a number of Hillary Clinton supporters agree that the media is tilting against Trump. Okay. Do you, based on your experience with alumni who have gone through to pause communication system and now work in the industry, do you believe that if you are a reporter and you are favoring Trump, say you in a conversation with someone and, you know, I really don't like Hillary Clinton, I, I might give Trump a, a go this time around. Do you believe that that would be held against you in some newsrooms in America? I would dare say that most right-leaning reporters in a newsroom probably wouldn't want to acknowledge that very much. Because but they I would fear this, reprisal in their job? They, they would feel that they don't fit into the culture there. But I, one thing I think that's really important for us to keep in mind here is that fairness is a skill and that it can be taught. And one thing I talk about in my own classes is that however you feel particularly about a candidate or an issue yeah, or whatever you can be fair. you have, Absolutely. you can I still try to be, be fair, fair to Hillary and provide I, balance. Yeah, I don't take cheap shots at her. I take her words and I analyze them. Do you feel, based on your Montclair University experience, that people working in the media um, are afraid almost to give balance because if they're perceived as being conservative or for Trump, they'll get hurt. There, they'll get hurt in their job. I don't think that's the case at all. The leading rep uh, reporter covering Donald Trump these days is a guy named Robert Costa at the Washington Post. Washington Post thought by some people in this institution and others to be liberal. His background is in the right-leaning press. He's well respected in that world. He covers Trump. People, his, his, his point of view is known. People acknowledge that. It's absolutely fine in the world we live in. What about the editor of the New York Times, Paquette, saying that at this point, um, fairness doesn't really matter because Trump's dangerous? Well, fairness always matters. I don't know that he you know, exactly I mean, but that's that. a signal, isn't that? Not a signal. <laughs> it's it a signal. Exactly. And he had a particular critique about cable television, and I, to a certain extent, share that critique. Uh, but which was? Which is that, that cable television, yeah. in letting Donald Trump get an enormous amount of airtime in the period of the primaries, basically assured his visibility and gave but him the, the nomination. But the other candidates could have really done important. the same thing. They didn't want to. He's an effective user of the television platform, the, no question about it. There, let me just... Uh, uh, and. I want you to comment on this, Ms. Uh, Professor McCall. 
I am the reigning largest audience getter in cable news. I can tell you, we wanted Kasich, we wanted Rubio, we wanted Jeb Bush. They wouldn't come on. Trump, he was in the hallway. I mean, he wanted to come on. He was smart. He took advantage. I would have put Hillary Clinton on every hour on the hour, but she doesn't want to do it. So I don't think you can blame Trump for taking what was offered to him. Not blaming Trump. Right. I'm saying the balance in... But there was the, no balance because they wouldn't show up. No, but there were, there were rallies throughout campaign season, especially in the primary season. And his, because they were colorful and dramatic and drew audiences, That got might be a legitimate point. But uh, personal appearances, the others did not take us up. Last word, Professor McCall. Well, I think the, the interesting thing about these surveys is that it shows that the public has enough gumption to sense the imbalance, and research from the Media Research Center proves that they're right. Oh, yeah. They came out with a study recently that showed that there are nine negative Trump stories in network television for every one that is positive, and there are two negative stories about Trump for every one about Hillary Clinton. Now, I'm, I'm all in favor of giving both candidates real scrutiny and a rough ride, but I think there needs to be balance there, and there's plenty of t stuff to cover about Hillary Clinton that's yep. probably but being it, but glossed But the, the stuff about Trump is more sensational, and, and always television will go to that. Gentlemen, good debate. Thank you very much. Plenty more as a factor moves along this evening. Miller on surviving the election. Then McCallum on some pro-Trump college students getting hammered. We hope you stay tuned for those reports. Thanks for staying with us. I'm Bill O'Reilly in the Miller Time segment tonight. Let's get right to the sage of Southern California. He joins us from Santa Barbara. It's five days left, Miller. Help me. Help me. I'm telling you. I don't know how much more before I can take. Before we get to it, Billy, yeah. before we get to it, I got to say that uh, the concert dates with Jesse, you and I are doing great. I sent out an email blast today. It should help even more. Actually, it wasn't an email blast. I sent it to Hillary, our concert schedule, marked <laughs> top secret confidential. So everybody will get it soon. Everybody will get yeah, it. WikiLeaks will have it like, you know, like yeah, that. Well, they, 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 I'm, I'm expecting to sell some <laughs> tickets. Here's what I would tell people to do over the last six days. Don't say who you're voting for out loud, because I'm telling you, when Hillary is not sucking down riblets by the gross drenched in hot sauce or sleeping like a Kodiak bear, Big Sis is watching. Don't say out loud <laughs> that you're not voting for her or you're going to be in trouble. And if she's not watching, Uma's watching. And trust me, she's up all night nowadays. Now listen, it's the Christmas season coming up, Billy, and I want everybody to relax about this election and remember the season. And I have a seasonal song for you. May I sing it to you? Of course, Miller. <laughs> <laughs> on the sixth day out from Hillary, my true love gave to me six poles of faking, five golden strings being pulled, four females accusing Bubba, three plus 30,000 emails missing, two leaked on a Brazil debate questions, and a wiener in an incoming text. There you go. No, I, I think we need to get the album right away on uh, however you get that these days. Um, I'll be selling it in the lobby at the Waters Miller O'Reilly show. You know, I, I, I think you may have coined a phrase, big sis, if she gets yeah. elected. She's like our big sis. Although well, I'm she's... listening to 1984, and it struck me today that they play rough over there. And can I tell all our listeners, if you're not going to vote for her, like I said, don't say anything, because... Uh, they deem that if you don't love and care like they do, they will destroy you. That's the <laughs> odd irony. So use your head out there. And remember, get out there and vote, because the election is close enough now that Hillary can definitely hijack it. Okay, now you say that you've given up pretty much on uh, the country ever coming back to its traditional grandeur. Yeah, but I, I don't mean it'll be a smoking hole in the mouth, No, no, Billy. no, but you I vote because of the become, vets. You vote because yeah, of the... Yeah, it'll be like right. Scandinavia. Yeah, it'll be like Scandinavia. It's cold over there, Mel. Uh, have you been? Have you been to Finland? Uh, I don't. You know, global warming well, is has not hit Finland. Very no, cold. No, it hasn't. But uh, I, I, once again, this stuff's going to be jammed down your throat. And I'm telling you, if she wins next Tuesday and you wake up the next day, just you don't want to be gang audited. Get your pod face on, because she is a soulless <laughs> banshee, and she's coming for you. It's funny. It's funny you mentioned. I was audited three times. Uh, in Bill Clinton's presidency, 
three consecutive years I was audited and and they didn't find anything I didn't have to pay anything because my my accountant Swifty is under <laughs> under strict orders pay it <laughs> well, no matter what it is pay it Swifty. all right we, we're Swifty. not at the Trump school of um, depreciation here Listen, I don't depreciate the tie pay it so but the fourth you can time suffer you can suffer an audit Billy because you've sold 10,000 books since we started this interview today <laughs> look I pay my fair share I know Bernie Sanders doesn't believe it but Bernie just bought a house on Lake Champlain and part of the reason he did was because of my tax money all right there but, you go. but the fourth time the fourth year I said to Swifty if, if they audit us four years in a row we're gonna file a lawsuit so I want the IRS to know that and it's true and we and we told him he said look you well, know, we don't mind being audited, me. but we're not going to be persecuted. So I hope what you're saying when, doesn't come true. When John Podesta is the chief of staff in two <laughs> weeks, you're getting gang yeah, audited. He's, he's like not I a big said. fan of mine, Podesta. I don't no. think he likes me at all. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, if he might not take the job, he might want to get back to his male modeling career on the runways of Milan. <laughs> I know, it's not been the same over in Italy since he left. Dennis yeah, Miller, he everybody. Is. There he is. You can get that song on uh, Netflix or someplace. <laughs> I don't know where. And a reminder that the Spin Stops Here live tour that Miller mentioned, featuring Waters, Miller, and me next year. We'll see everybody in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Friday, January 13th, Reading, Pennsylvania, next night, Saturday, January 14th. Then out to Omaha, Nebraska, Century League Arena, Friday, March 24th. Tacoma Dome, Washington State, Saturday, March 25th, wrapping it up, the first half of the year. Westbury, Long Island, my home turf, June 17th. Tickets make tremendous gifts for Christmas and Hanukkah. Details on BillOReilly.com. Martha McCallum on deck, staying up late for us. Some pro-Trump college students under pressure. Martha, moments away. Here now to explain further, Fox News anchor Martha McCallum. That was Pitt, University of Pittsburgh. University of Pittsburgh. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's a tough situation. If you want to be standing at the table with the Trump bumper stickers and the pins, they were right near another table of Hillary supporters. But you heard that you know the crowd sure. cheering and laughing yeah. as this kid is is yelling epithets at the people at this table. This one woman was saying, you know, how can you be a woman and support Trump yelling at this student? I mean, obviously they have every right uh, to be there, but you see these kids clapping and that the language that they're throwing around um, is just atrocious. It's, yeah. it's vitriolic. I wonder how widespread this is. Um, have been any, seen it other, we have definitely seen it on other campuses. Yeah. There was another story a while back about people who built a wall on campus and then other people spray painted it and tore it down. Uh, there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of vitriol out there for young students. And a lot of it comes from the top. We had a story the other night about DePaul University in Chicago, not DePaul, where we just had the journalism instructor, but DePaul, nation's largest Catholic college, wouldn't let the Republican club put up a sign that said, unborn lives matter, wouldn't let them put it up. And that, I think, that, that kind of... Um, yeah. A message gets down, and uh, almost uh, all universities these days are run by people who are very left. Well, well, that's the problem. And the University of Pittsburgh put a statement out saying, you know, we really want everyone to respect each other in the final days of this election, especially this election, which does have a lot of people afraid to talk about the fact that sure. they support Donald Trump in many cases. Um, and these students claim they feel the university has handled it well. Nobody was reprimanded uh, or disciplined as far as we know they say they keep disciplinary actions private uh, but clearly they know the students who did this because yep. they're very evident on this this cell phone video okay now at nyu which is a liberal university here in new york city new york university it was a professor who was supporting trump right yeah and then did he get the boot or what happened to him? Yeah. You know, I mean, th this guy says he claims he was booted from the classroom for his ideas. He is very anti-PC. He says safe spaces and trigger warnings are not PC. They are insane. He's written a lot about this. He uh, writes about the 19th century, about secularism. Um, clearly, he has professors and other colleagues who are very unhappy that he's there. And he writes, academic freedom is great as long as you don't use it. And he claims he was booted from NYU. NYU, we talked to uh, them and got a statement from them as well. They say he was not asked to leave, that he asked for a leave of absence. What and he that teach? he is welcome to return in the spring semester. Um, he teaches a course on 19th century uh, culture and anti-secularism. He's written a lot um, on well, know, he's cultural a, he's a liberalism traditional is, guy is the category and, that he right. falls under. And he's, so they, but he's NYU, to be clear, they said they didn't get rid of him. That's he can come saying. back in the spring if he wants to. He should. I think he should. He should definitely um, come back. Yeah, I mean, any any 
conservative or traditional professor gets an opportunity should take it. I but, mean, you but the fact that. is that he's ganged up on by colleagues. Of I mean, that's, that's where no, nobody's happen. disputing. He's he had a Twitter account um, that was called "Deplorable NYU Professor," and of course that you know they, they just completely <laughs> right, flipped right. them out. Uh, they didn't want anybody who had that title working. You're with always going to have that at universities if you're a traditional or a conservative or re even a Republican. You know, you're always going to have that kind of bias against you. But you got to stand up and be a man. And, and the or presidents woman. of these universities have to make sure that there is a safe space for both kinds a safe of space. opinion. Yeah, talk about yeah. safe spaces. Uh -huh. How about a safe space for these kids and their table? Yeah, but they'd be lonely. The kids would just be in there by themselves. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you know. The Trump table, we have a special place for That's you. That's right. I, You're you know, over here. I feel sorry for the guys at the Trump table. Dating is going to be tough. Exactly. I mean, it's not, it's not going to be an easy slot until after the election. <laughs> All right, Martha McCallum, everybody. Thanks for staying up late. We'll see you in Hammer, 9 Eastern time in the morning. Fact to tip of the day, brutal battle that the American Army won in a very unusual way. Actually, there were Marines as well. The tip, moments away. In fact, a tip today, very unusual American military victory. But first, no better time to sign up or re-up for BillOReilly.com premium membership. If you do, you get any one of my books free of charge, plus a copy of the Constitution. PMs get their own private news service every day, the No Spin News, and it's a good one tonight. And also big discounts on all our stuff for holiday giving, so we hope you check out premium membership. Now the mail, Priscilla Nelson, Reno, Nevada. Bill, from a journalistic perspective, what was the purpose of hounding Governor Pence by asking if he thought Hillary Clinton is corrupt? Legitimate question in light of the polling shift after the FBI announced new tactics in the email investigation. Priscilla, is a very pithy question. Bob Manuel, Indian Land, South Carolina. Bill, you're badgering Pence mm -hmm. on the corruption issue is way over the top bullying. Look, I'm well aware that some viewers want campaign stops for the candidates they support. I'm aware of that. That's never going to happen here. I want to know if the Republican ticket, Trump and Pence, if they believe they're running against a corrupt candidate. And you should want to know that too. Phil Whitaker, Amelia Island, Florida, even though I support Trump, Pence never ceases to amaze me why seasoned politicians refuse to give yes or no answers to simple questions. Dr. Alec, Arthur Alex, Palm Coast, Florida, O'Reilly, your assertion that Hillary Clinton did a good job as senator is without merit. Made no such assertion, doctor, and do not believe you even watched the Talking Points memo. I said she did good work getting resources to New York after the 9-11 attack, which is true. Stay off the ideological website, sir. Bob Munson, Newberry Park, California. Come on, Bill. Dwight Eisenhower had no political experience when elected president. Good grief, Bob. <laughs> he was a supreme allied commander in World War II. Read Killing Patton if you want to know his political experience. Same goes for Generals Grant, Harrison, and Jackson. Catherine White, uh, Wilmette, Illinois. Obama had less experience than Trump when he ran. False, Catherine. He was a senator. And McMillan, Lilburn, Georgia. I'm okay with Trump having no political experience. Look where Clinton's experience has gotten us. Okay, there you go. Ted Letty, Dublin, Ireland. Bill, do you share my concern that Trump may start an international incident if somebody insults him as president? Other than Trump putting the Trump sign over the Eiffel Tower? No, I'm not worried about it, Ted. Like him or not, Trump is not off the rails. Fine tonight, Factor Tip of the Day. There's a new war movie called Hacksaw Ridge, directed by Mel Gibson. That's going to come out on Friday. It has received a lot of advanced publicity. Very intense, I hear. Now, Martin Dugard and I know that because we write about the Battle of Okinawa in Killing the Rising Sun. And we focus on the same guy that Gibson features, a medic named Desmond Doss, who refused to carry a gun, but emerged as one of the bravest soldiers in the Pacific theater. The Doss pages in Rising Sun are harrowing, and you might want to check them out if you are interested in seeing that movie. Factor tip of the day. And that is it for us tonight. Please check out the Fox News Factor website. Differ for BillOReilly.com. Also, we'd like you to spout off about the fact of anywhere in the world. O'Reilly at FoxNews.com. O'Reilly at FoxNews.com. Name in town if you wish to opine. Word of the day, New Sophistry. When writing to the Factor. Now, I have extended invitations to both the Trump and Clinton campaigns. Come on to Factor on Monday. We did this last time around with Romney and Obama um, for an extensive interview. 
We do not believe that Hillary Clinton will do it, uh, as we mentioned earlier. We hope she reconsiders. Trump may show up. I hope he does. He might show up tomorrow. He might show up Sunday. We have a special Sunday. He might be out there in my car right now, but he's in Pensacola. So we don't know about uh, Trump, but we are trying to get you the latest info before you vote. Again, thanks for watching us tonight. I'm Bill O'Reilly. Please remember that the spin stops here because we are definitely looking out.